Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Subtalk is going to talk about how we can basically pay people with blockchain for doing open source code. So get on with it. Yeah, hello, everyone. So if you saw, if you have been sitting here for a while, you have seen that my laptop just crashed. So I'm using another laptop. I hope everything else works out. Uh, so let's get started, yeah. So this is me. This is my Twitter handle. I have been an open source contributor for some five years now. And with open source, obviously, community comes as an important part. So I have been involved in that too. But I'm basically still a developer. So I write code. I do all the back end, front end, and all those kind of stuff that most of us do. But this talk is not about code. This talk is about you, about all the open source contributors, open source maintainers. Anyone who has to do anything with open source, basically. So I guess by the fourth day of OS Asia, you people are already all convinced that everyone needs to do open source, everything needs to be open source, and that's the best way to go about it. But then there are still some few people who might still have nah, maybe some statistical data. So I'll throw you some statistical data. Uh, this is 96 plus million active GitHub repositories, but as we heard in the Indeed talk, there are like 50% other open source activities which happen outside GitHub. So there are a lot of open source projects, you can say. 78% uh, companies run on open source. So it's like the company might not be an open source based project or whatever it is. It might be a closed source company, but definitely they're using some kind of open source or other. If not anything, they're surely running a Linux server or something like that. So 78% companies run on open source. 92% applications contain some kind of open source libraries. So most probably any website, even if it's a closed source company, whether it be Grab or anything, they are probably using some kind of open source library, right? Like, if not anything, JavaScript, jQuery, Python, Ruby, almost all of them are open source. So as you can understand that most of the people, whether it be open source project or not, somehow use open source anyways, right? So open source does have an impact on everyone's life. So if you, know, if you know about open source, you don't know about open source, you're definitely using open source. Uh, so that's all. But then some money talks. So $387 billion of economic value provided by open source. This is a statistic by Black Duck Software. So open source itself provide, like produces for 387 billion of economic values all over the world, right? So that says a lot. Though we say free, free, free all the time, but there's a lot of money involved, right? But what motivates most of us to do open source, right? Like many of us are saying that everyone should be doing open source, open source all the time, but there are two parts of motivation, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Uh, intrinsic motivations, like personal hobby, many of us just do open source as a hobby project while working in a proper closed source company. Many of us do just for the enjoyment of learning, because with open source comes a lot of learning. You can learn from different parts of the world without even having to go into the physical place on yourself, right? Fun and culture, because like the community, the everything, the people around open source, it's all fun. It's all about the culture of the open source, right? Extrinsic. So what are the extrinsic motivation? Peer-to-peer -peer recognitions, like many other open source people who are like really valued in the community, they come to recognize you. So that's one of the extrinsic motivations. Career advancement. So obviously, being part of open source conferences, being part of many open source projects often helps you to get a better career, right? We have seen this happening again and again. Self-marketing. Right, and financial rewards. So I'm gonna talk about more about the financial rewards because we have seen that that's a problem still there in open source. So 62% of the open source projects are still self-funded. What do I mean by self-funded? When I say self-funded, means that these projects basically have no source of money coming from anywhere else. It's just a maintainer who had maybe started off it as a hobby project, and now they're developing on it. And yeah, it's mostly the pocket comes out of their money or a few group of people's money. So 62% of open source projects are basically self-funded. So that's a little bit kind of a problem. So 
The problem I'm going to talk about is sustainability. So is open source sustainable? So there are different ways that people who are doing open source go about sustaining themselves. Some of them have Patreon accounts. So, um, so that kind of solves a little bit, but it's not very focused, right? For Patreon accounts, there are YouTubers who also have a Patreon accounts. There are video vloggers who have a Patreon account. So they, the open source developers are not like really the main use case of Patreon, so as to say, right? So, and there are many different other ways of sustaining, but not always works out. And if you are not convinced that, nah, maybe he's saying just jargons and it's sustainable. So anyone who use semantic UI over here, front-end developers? Okay. So anyone who has used Bootstrap? Okay. So <laughs> If you have used Bootstrap, Semantic UI is, uh, I, according to me, it's a better version of Bootstrap because it doesn't make your website look like Twitter. <laughs> but yeah, so this is the author of Semantic UI. So there was this issue in Semantic UI about is Semantic UI development dead? And as you can see, it has a lot of stars. So many people do use Semantic UI. It's not like just yet another project and no one practically uses it, but it's got a pretty decent number of users. And this is what the reply was to that issue. Basically what it says is he has been spending quite some time in Semantic UI, but it's not a sustainable way of living. And he also has to leave, he has to sustain himself. So according to that, he feels that it's not financially stable for him to contribute to this project. And that's why he has been like inactive in the Semantic UI development. Here's another example. Anyone know about this incident, event stream? So this happened like in the end of last year, and anyone who is a JavaScript developer probably should be knowing about this incident. So this event stream incident actually kind of wrecked almost all the projects in the NPM, right? So what happened is basically this guy who was maintaining event stream, right? So he also failed the same problem. He failed that event stream is basically not sustainable for him. He has to do other stuff so he can sustain himself. So he became pretty inactive in event stream. And then there came another contributor and he is like, hey, so I would like to maintain event stream. And he's like, why not? Sure, because I'm not anyways doing it. It's not a sustainable way of doing. So anyone who says that they want to maintain it, I am pretty okay with it. So he gives him the access and what happens is like, a uh, day or two after people discovered that event stream has some uh, malicious code in it and almost all the npm packages which used in event stream which is a lot uh, kind of breaks so you by seeing the reactions i guess you can understand what happened uh, yeah this is another tweet that came out so anyone who has heard about eslint uh, if you're a JavaScript developer and you haven't heard about any linting tool, it's really sad. Uh, but OK. So this is basically another example where he says, like, yeah, he does ESLint, which is used by practically anyone who uses JavaScript, right? Because JavaScript, as we know, is a great language. But uh, until and unless you write it in a good way, it's not really great in a programmatic way. So ESLint really helps in that keeping all the linting stuff good, like keeping the code clean. So almost everyone who writes JavaScript uses ESLint, right? But his mom is like, how much do you earn from it? And he's like, nothing. So yeah, here's another example, Babel.js. Anyone who has heard about Babel.js? So if you are an ECMAScript developer, I guess you have heard about Babel.js because, yeah, again, all those JavaScript jargons. But so this is a very practical example, right? If Microsoft says you, if you are using a service of Microsoft, like the normal users, not like the open source enthusiast maybe, but if you're using a Microsoft server or whatever be the case, and they ask you for some money because of the service, you're like, okay, but if someone says, see, Babel.js, you are practically using it every day. Would you like to donate to us? Um, why should I? Because I'm getting it for free. So yeah, there is a problem in the sustainability in open source, as I guess is relevant. 
So this is kind of the life of a maintainer in many cases. Like most of the open source projects, I'm not talking about the big open source projects, but many of the open source projects like ESLint, BabelJS, Semantic UI, they basically have just one or two maintainers who are working, and they also are not working in the project entire time. So working in this project is not really sustainable for them, right? So this is how most of the life as a maintainer goes. Like it's about learning. They learn how to make the project better, do all the stuff that they can, create value by the project so that other people can like use these projects. And then comes what happens is they, the cost that they're giving into the project is basically time, right? More than the money is the time, and they're not getting much out of it. So many of the time, what happens is it leads to burnout. So this is kind of the design space that I in, we in Gitcoin are working in. So it's like the blockchain and open source place. So when I put blockchain and open source together and put a plus, I know many people might get offended in the open source community. But I'm going to try a little to convince you. Uh, so in blockchain, the most of the things in blockchain are still open source, right? And we are still trying to make most of the things open source. Uh, there are some things which are closed source and it's not really good as we heard, like smart contracts should also be open source, right? So those kind of things. Uh, the good thing about blockchain is, I would say, it kind of helps. So I see blockchain personally as a, another technical stack, though most people see it as a cryptocurrency. So anyone who hears blockchain kind of hears Bitcoin in the back of their mind. But I'm going to talk about it as a technical stack, right? It's just another technical stack, just like writing in Python, writing in React, writing in any other language, right? So it's a technical stack which kind of provides you with financial services on every programmatic transaction, right? And it's, in a way, done with open source, right? So what happens is any money produced by blockchain can kind of be associated, again, back to open source. And that's why you can practically fund open source projects using blockchain. And Apart from that, also blockchain helps in the, all the staking part of the things. So many of you who have worked as a freelance developer, you know like stakeholding is one of the important parts because you never know whether you will be paid at the end of the day. Uh, so you can always use smart contract as an application for that, right? So the problem, as we can see, is on two sides, right? The, why is there only one maintainer? Why is there no contributor to the project? The reason is the contributors don't get anything out of it. Yes, many people work only for the swags, for the t-shirts, for the stickers, but that doesn't really last long, right? So that's why there might be many projects which doesn't really get a lot of contributors, uh, until and unless they have like real belief and faith in the project and so on. But and at the same time, the repo maintainers, they can't really prioritize on issues. Like most of the work, if they, it's a priority, they have to work on it themselves because they don't really have a lot of contributors to work on, or they can't really rely on getting a contributor whenever they need it. Right? So that's the problem that we are kind of trying to solve in Gitcoin, trying to make open source sustainable for both the contributors and the maintainers. So this is kind of the flow, right? So the funder whether the funder has some funding from Consensus or Ethereum Foundation, or he has his own large amount of blockchain Ethereum lying in his somewhere. And he needs developers, right? So everyone needs the developers. So what they can do is they can basically just come to a platform and fund an issue. And what the contributor would do in this case is go to the issue, they would contribute to the project, and they get whatever the funding was. So whatever the funding they get, the contributor has this motivation, the extrinsic motivation that we were talking about, the financial rewards. So the contributor can basically get those financial rewards, and the extrinsic motivation like, makes them to continue with their contributions again and again. But with the funder, what they can do is they can basically prioritize on the issue. So even if they can't depend on one single contributor, they know that we can put a and bounty in this our platform. And then some or the other open source contributor, if they have the skills to do this, will pick this up. So that's kind of the flow. So, and the idea is to make jobs or work something like this left side of the image, a mesh-like architecture, not really, even though most of the startups would say that we have a flat hierarchy, but it still kind of ends up being 
some hierarchy, but a mesh-like network would kind of enable, like, maybe the founder of this project can also be contributing to another project, and another project's founder contributes back to another project. So it's an entire mesh rather than a very hierarchy-tree-like structure, right? So that's kind of the aim that we are striving for. So to convince that Gitcoin kind of works, so we started off in November 2017, and are the data visible out there back? Okay, I hope so. So the total platform value we already have is 900K dollar-ish. It's more than that right now. And we have like 300 plus funders, 17,000 plus developers. So as you can see, the idea is something like Uber or Grab, right? Where you can basically be like, you put a job and some, you know that someone will actually take it up. And at the same time, the contributors can go there and always hope to find a job lying for them. So that's the way it's like converting the open source model into a job kind of a model, where both the maintainer and the developer can actually have some kind of benefit out of it. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the bounties thing that we have that I've been telling about. So if you go to the bounties page, I'll put all the links at the end of the slide. So we basically have a listing of all the bounties, and these bounties are basically just open source issues. Right now, Gitcoin is integrated with GitHub, so these are practically GitHub issues which someone has funded, come to our platform, funded it with any ERC20 tokens. So Gitcoin doesn't have any token of ourselves, like it's not a cryptocurrency, it's not a token. You can come and practically fund with any ERC20 token that you have, like be it Ethereum, be it DAI, be it Litecoin, whatever it is. And these are all the listings of all the bounties that have been funded in the platform, right? So you can put all the filters, go to maybe Python projects or JavaScript project or any kind of project. It's not like every project is a blockchain project even, right? And then you click on any of the bounties that you're interested. So if anyone is thinking why he's not giving a demo and showing screenshots, well, I didn't do my human sacrifice to the demo gods today, so I'll stick to screenshots. Uh, so this is like the bounty details that you can see. So if you click on a bounty, you will see that this page appears where basically you have a description which is just like the GitHub description for the issue. So there's a button which most people use that's view on GitHub, right? So you can just practically view on GitHub and it's another open source issue right there. After you've clicked on, so if you see there's a start work button, so if you click on the start work button and start working on a particular issue, it's practically still the open source flow that you do, like which all of you who are contributors are familiar with, right? So you would go, you would actually go to the channel where they do all the conversations, you would submit a pull request, you would then like have a review, go to and fro about the review, and all those things, right? So it already has all the benefits of open source. We are not like getting in the path of those things. It's, so everything comes into that after you have started working. It's still the open source flow. Once you have completed your work, your pull request is submitted and merged and reviewed and everything. So basically, you come back to this page, which will have a submit work option. So after you have clicked on start work, the start work button basically changes to submit work. And you can click on the submit work, you put the pull request which has been merged related to the particular bounty that you were working on, and then the funder comes and pays you, right? So that's basically the flow, that's it, and you get whatever the funding amount was, right? So that's basically the Gitcoin bounties that I've been talking about. Then there is something called Code Fund. Have any one of you heard about Code Fund? So if anyone has gone to Sustain OSS, I guess you might have heard about Code Fund by Eric Berry. So Code Fund is kind of an ethical advertisement. Uh, it's helps. It's an open ad platform that funds contributors to like of the open source ecosystem to put their jobs out there. Then there is something called Gitcoin Grants. This is something that we newly started in around like November, December of 2018. And Gitcoin Grants, it's kind of in the model of Patreon, but then it's particularly meant for the maintainers of an open source project. So what you can do is basically if you have an open source project with a team, so you can come to our platform, you can create a Gitcoin grants, and you can say, okay, this is the amount of grants that I'm expecting. And it's a subscription-based model, so anyone who is into blockchains, you can actually go to the EIP-1337 and read about the entire subscription protocol. And 
So what happens is he gets uh, from the entire grant amount, he will be getting like some money out of it every month. So it's like the subscription model and you get the money every monthly wise, right? So you subscribe to that and basically anyone can go and fund your project. So like what the idea behind this is basically even the tiniest amounts of funds will basically amount to a large amount of fund for your project finally and you get the money out of it. And we are doing something called CLR matching right now. So what happens in CLR matching is whatever the amount you fund to a particular project, we will be matching that amount for you. So this leads to a graph something like this. So if you fund someone funds $275, firstly we will fund $275, which leads to $550. Then if someone again funds $275, it actually amounts to $825. And as you can see, it gets up higher and higher, right? So this is something that we are doing. It's currently in progress till, if I'm not wrong, April 19th. So anyone who wants, you can go to the Gitcoin Grants page. I have the link at the end. And you can see that if you feel like an open source project that you want to fund for, you can do that. And we will be doing a sailor matching to that. This is something very recent. So this is like the inflation funding. This is not yet implemented. It's in a proposal state. So EIP 1789, anyone can go and read about it. So disclosure, I'm not the author. It's my CEO is the author. But yeah. And inflation funding. So what? anyone has any idea about inflation funding in blockchains? Anyone has heard about it? So inflation funding is a term that's like been there for a month or so, I guess, or a little more than that in the blockchain ecosystem where they say like, say inflation funding is kind of like the mining itself, the work itself should pay you. Like you don't have to, uh, someone else doesn't have to pay you. The transaction or the mining itself would pay you. So that way it's kind of a reward for doing the mining for yourself or whatever. So. 10% increase in the block rewards. So it would be like it could fund up to $100 million, so as to say. Right? So that's something that's very new. You can all read about it. And I would really like to know about your, like, what do you feel about this thing? Because we are really excited about this. And that brings me to the end of my talk. So these are all the reference links. So the gitcoin.co explorer will take you to all the bounties that are listed over there. The how contributor and onboard contributor basically goes, like, takes you through all the steps that you need for, to become a contributor. Gitcoin.grants has all the grants pages, like all the grants listed. You can also go and create your own grants. And the last link is basically the inflation funding EIP link. So that's. All, any questions? Okay, I guess. So if you have any questions, I will be around, and also you can go to the Slack channel and ping any of us. Uh, no questions? Anyone? Nope. Okay, thank you very much.